Hello everyone, it's Lindsay and welcome back to my channel. Today I am doing my annual money video. I do this video every year just to kind of like, number one, keep myself organized, but number two, just to kind of pull back the veil on traditional publishing a little bit and let you guys see how those of us who do this full time make money, what we do with that money, what the percent income breakdown looks like, things like that. I think that these types of videos are really helpful to help you guys set expectations, like realistic expectations, if you want to enter traditional publishing. I did the same video last year, so I will link that down below if you are interested. Also, my friend Lizelle Sanbury does a very similar type of video every year as well, so I'll link that down below too. Before I get started, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of background information on me and my general household finances, so you kind of have a you know full picture. I am disabled and therefore unemployed and my spouse is the main breadwinner in the household. No human dependence, which makes things a lot cheaper, and we live in a big city suburb, so it's decently cheap where we live. That being said, the money that I bring into the household as a full-time author is from a two-book deal that I got with Scholastic. It was in auction. However, I do consider myself like deeply a mid-list author. There, <laughs> that should kind of like illuminate you on the situation. I wanna talk really quickly about my quotation marks around full-time author. Because I am disabled, I would not be working otherwise. However, since this is my job that I picked up while I was home, it's like, you know, my full-time job. A lot of times full-time author is synonymous with like main breadwinner or making enough income to support yourself if you didn't have a spouse and that is not my situation whatsoever. I would be on the streets. <laughs> As I always say in these types of videos, I am not a mathematician. My math's probably wrong at some point. Just don't call it out if you see it. Pull up my charts and we'll get started. Okay, first let's talk about the channels of income that I had for 2023. All of my money came from either advances from my publisher, YouTube payments, or honorariums. Let's kind of break that down a little bit, maybe for some of you who are newer to looking into some of these terms. Advances are a payment that you receive from a publisher when you get a book deal. They're usually broken down into chunks. In my video last year, I made this fun little chart with you guys showing what percent of money I got and at what time over a three year period. I would go check that out just to kind of understand how my personal advance breakdown happened. YouTube money is pretty much through AdSense, which is their method of putting in ads and videos and you getting paid so much for how many views those get. Sidebar, if you'd like to help out your favorite channels, uh, don't skip the ads. And honorariums are a fee that is paid when authors do presentations or anything where we just like show up and chat. Schools, libraries, societies, things like that uh, give you a little bit of money. These can vary widely. I mean, if you're like big fancy author, you probably get like thousands of dollars. <laughs> but for most of us, midless, it's like what, like a couple hundred dollars to five to seven hundred dollars probably is what I'm guessing a normal range is. Depending on what you're doing, obviously more intensive things like workshops are going to pay more. I have a publicist that I work with and I also have a team of school and library consultants, I guess, at Scholastic who when a request comes in to them for an event, they kind of like tell me what that what is expected of me and they say, we think this is how much you should ask for it. Do you want to ask for more? Do you want to ask for less? Let us know. One thing you might notice on this chart is that there is no section for royalties. That is because I have not earned out of any of the books in my book deal. Earning out means that the amount of advance that the publisher gives you up front has been met by the amount of sales of the book. In general terms, it's a lot more complicated than that, but just in general, that's the idea. They give you $100,000, then you need $100,000 in sales to be considered earned out and therefore start earning royalties. I will talk more about this later, but as of now, no royalties. <laughs> Probably will never see royalties. Most authors don't. In 2023, I got my final payment from Scholastic for the two book deal. And that was for 22% of the total advance. Again, watch that video I did last year where I broke down everything there. But that was the only payment that I got from them this whole year. I just had one last final payment that was on the odds publication date. And that was it. <laughs> that was it. And that's not uncommon in publishing. So set your expectations. Now I would like to talk about my personal income. Again, this goes back to being a full-time author and not being able to make ends meet on my own right now where my career is. As you can see, I am not bringing in near as much money as my spouse this year. We can also see the comparison here from 2022 and 2021. So you can really see it 
changing year by year. Next, let's chat about how I spend the money that I get as an author. This is the breakdown. I always put up 15% of the amount of money I make from every channel into a retirement fund because there is no 401k really when you're self-employed. I put up 40% for taxes. I don't need to do that. Um, I've done that the past few years just because I was like worried I'd rather have too much money saved up than not enough. But every year I'm paying like I thought it was like 13% last year or something. Maybe it was closer to 20, I don't know. But I put up more than double of what I need every year. And I think I'm gonna stop that. I would rather just have more money now in that spending section than um, just getting, you know, like a huge chunk after I do my taxes in January or whatever, so. But yeah, I mean, you can tell I have a lot of Capricorn in my chart. <laughs> the top sliver, that is 2%. That is my marketing saving fund that I had for the odds. As my book was coming out, I wanted to have some money saved up just in case I wanted to do things like shipping arcs, having a launch party, things like that. So 2% was up for that. And then when the book came out in September, any money that I had left over in that fund that I didn't use, I just kind of transferred that into a house savings fund because me and my husband want to save up and get our own place so I can have some land and get some goats. And the rest is just spending. Most of this is just regular boring things like bills, utility, food, things like that, but also squishmallows. <laughs> Maybe next year I'll like put on a chart like how much of my spending goes to squishmallows. <laughs> Now let's talk about that 2% sliver that was the odds marketing. So I had a book come out in 2023. As an author, you always want to kind of do like little fun stuff for your book because you're really excited about it. The great thing was a lot of the things that I had already purchased for the Glass Witch release were able to be like recycled and used again for the odds. So there is a couple things that if I would have done this chart for the Glass Witch, you would have seen on there that isn't on this one. For example, bookmarks. I have a ton of the Glass Witch bookmarks left over. So I just keep using those until they're gone. That was a huge huge expense that I didn't have to pay for this year. I also didn't have any travel expenses this year with the odds, so that was also helpful. And then a lot of the decor and fun little goodies that I give out at the launch party, again, could just be reused. But in general, a 30% of that marketing went to my website. This always makes me so sad. I hate how expensive it is every month to keep a website up. It keeps going up. At first, my hosting fees were like $15 a month, and now they're going up to like 18, and I'm just like, ugh. shipping and packing it was mainly for arcs and final copies. These are for giveaways or for just like media boosting that are sent to reviewers. And the biggest chunk was for my launch party just because I needed to buy things like, you know, fresh things like cookies, refreshments, drinks. I also did of course buy some decor because you know, it was spooky season and you always have to go out and buy Halloween decor even if you have <laughs> 17 bins in your garage. <laughs> Let's take a quick little interlude folks to talk about taxes and how this works. I'm just gonna do the basic because I have an accountant and I don't do the numbers. <laughs> but here are the basics. When you're an author, you're self-employed. Self-employed folks have to do taxes every quarter, so four times a year. It kind of sucks and I highly recommend getting an accountant if you can afford one. They are 100% worth their weight in gold and I mean, you can write them off in your taxes anyway, right? Speaking of writing things off, I wanted to go through my author expense tracker with you guys. I am a rigorous expense keeper because there are are so many things as an author that you can write off that you don't even really think about that will save you on money in the long run. First of all, a huge chunk of things that I write off is anything that is office supplies -y at all. So anything for my planners, any stickers, any pens, sticky notes, notebooks, you're never paying for those again. You're writing them off. You are paying for them, but you're writing them off your taxes. You're not being taxed for them. Another thing that I always write off is any books that I buy. Every time I go to Barnes and Noble and I buy a book, that's getting written off because that is research. That is a aid in you learning how to write and how to critically think as an author. So to me, that is a business expense. I wrote off my entire England trip that I took in May because I wrote on that trip. So it was a business trip essentially. And a lot of the places that we visited in England were research for what I needed to write. I'm writing a Gothic horror that's gonna be set in like the 1890s. And so any of the museums, or places like that, historical sites that I went to, writing all that off. You can write off any special clothing or accessories that you bought for an event. Say if you wanna have a launch party and get a fancy new outfit, write that off, that's a business expense. Anything that I buy for my bedroom, which my bedroom doubles as my office, since this is my workspace, and it's gonna go state by state, like how many square footage you can actually write off. You can write off a part of your rent. Again, check with your, your state laws about how much square footage gets written off. 
it's like a whole thing. This is why I recommend getting an accountant. But um, yeah, I write off some of the rent, some of the utilities, some of my cell phone bill can be written off because I do chat with my agent and my editor on here. And then anything that I get in the bedroom that goes in the bedroom or my office, those things get written off. So when I got a new standing desk, that got written off. I got a new mouse and a new keyboard, a new mouse pad, a coffee warmer, all written off. I also do less fun things that people don't think about. Like I have an air purifier, I wrote that off because that's to keep the air clean here in my office. I have a fan, that fan needs to be replaced, writing it off. New light bulbs, write it off. I'm trying to save you guys the money. Also my last piece of advice with this, it might sound tedious, but those of you that are are on submission to be traditionally published, I would say to start keeping a log of everything that you think is an expense already. Because in the case that your book is picked up and sold to a publisher, all of the expenses that you used while writing that book are tax deductible. <laughs> So even if you don't have a book deal right now, you could be missing out on money if you're not keeping track of all of these things to eventually write off later. And that's it. I'm gonna stop talking about taxes because I really don't know that much. Moving on. The last thing that I wanted to chat about was my royalty statement and my sales. I wanna mainly focus on the Glass Witch because I don't have that much data yet about the odds. It's still too early, but I have at least six-ish months of data for the Glass Witch. So that's what we're gonna focus on is Glass Witch sales in 2023. This first chart here is showing the amount of sales of the Glass Witch sold in the Scholastic Book Fairs versus trade, and trade is just like the fancy colloquial term for like regular average Joes buying the book at like Target, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, things like that. As you can see, <laughs> the book fair is really, really pulling for me. I had a video go up a couple weeks ago where I talked about how the Glass Witch did not get a paperback in the Scholastic Book Fair. They've just had the hardcover, except in Canada. <laughs> in Canada, the paperback did a killing in the book fair. I am pretty sure most of that book fair sales, that 70%, a very high majority of that is coming from Canada. Next, I have a chart of the sales by location. These are the only ones that got displayed because my stats from Asia, the Middle East, and Australia and New Zealand were so small that they were not calculated by Google Sheets. But you can see the Canadians love me. They love the Glass Witch. And I mean, I'm not gonna lie, this is kind of sad. This is kind of sad. Like, you should sell more books in your home country than anywhere else. But those kids in the Scholastic Book Fair, they just gobbled up that Glass Witch paperback. And maybe if we get a Glass Witch paperback in the US fairs, it'll even out more, but what do I know? That tiny sliver up there is in Europe. And just to share for funsies, in Australia and New Zealand, I had 28 sales. In the Middle East and in Asia, both. I had two sales. I have four Eastern fans and I am just so happy about that. <laughs> I'm just imagining like the two people in like such a huge, like I'm just imagining China, like a massive country and they're just like, hmm, the glass witch, I'll be the voice. <laughs> I love you, whoever you are. And last but not least, I thought we would talk about the Glass Witch earnout situation. I thought I would show a chart and show you where kind of the Glass Witch is right now. I never expect to earn out. I feel like it's actually a really healthy thing to go into these deals not expecting to earn out or else you just like might get disappointed. It's just not the norm anymore. Now maybe I thought I could take a moment to kind of reflect on the year. Just kind of share my thoughts on how finances went, how spending went. So as I already mentioned, I think that big tax saving part, I'm not gonna put up 40% anymore. It just seems a little bit unnecessary and I think it would be wiser to have the money now to be able to spend it on the things that I need rather than waiting for a big chunk later. One of the best things that I did this year that I talked about in my last video that I wanted to do was that I, sorry I'm like right by my window and I just saw my husband pull home from work early. <laughs> Got really confused. Okay exciting new development. Um, he brought me food. <laughs> His job paid for like a, basically a Thanksgiving feast for all of the workers. And we only live a minute away from where he works. So sometimes when they like buy pizza or buy everybody Chipotle or dinner or whatever, he'll like sneak and bring me some. Not shown are the two Hawaiian rolls, which are already deceased. <laughs> you guys might not know this about me, but I do not know how to act around warm bread. Okay, back to business. Reflections. What I was saying was one of the things that I did this year that I'm so happy I did was that I got a specific debit card solely for 
using for author expenses. I don't use it for anything else, but things that went towards marketing or my website or whatever. It just made organization so much easier, bookkeeping so much easier. I know exactly how much I'm spending and I'm not having to switch money between like credit cards and accounts and all this stuff. It just comes straight out of one and done. It's perfect. And looking at these charts, I think one thing that I think I'm, I'm going to see go up for next year is honorariums. Uh, one of my goals, one of my goals for 2024 was that I really want to do more school school visits, school tours. Uh, I'm gonna at least try it and see if I like it and see if it's not like really scary <laughs> for me. If I do, well then that portion of the pie chart will get bigger because I'll be doing more events and therefore I'll be getting more honorariums. More of my income will be coming from that than it was this year. All right, so that's it. That is all of the income and the percent breakdown. Sorry, I'm not giving actual figures. Mind your business. <laughs> get an accountant, bookkeep rigorously, drink water, eat warm bread and that's it that's it you guys finally the end of year beginning of year content for me is over we can get back to regularly scheduled programming where i can do like vlogs and just like hang out and chat with you guys <sighs> i'm so ready thank you all so much for watching and don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already both the odds and the glass witch are available for order i always have links down below and um yeah that's all for me can't wait to see you guys in the next one and i will see you then Bye.